Good evening, and welcome back students, teachers, and administrators from a week of spring break. It is 6.30 on Monday, March the 28th, 2022, and I now call the Whittenwood City School Board of Education meeting to order. Due to the lack of my voice, I'm gonna turn it over to our vice president to run the meeting because I have a very bad case of laryngitis. But if you would silence your cell phones and rise with me to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Seymour. Would you please call the vote? Present. Mr. Smith. Present. Mr. Hardy. Present. Mr. Bryan. Present. And Dr. Johnson. Present. Uh, sorry. Mr. Birdie, <laughs> you have the floor. <laughs> uh, as we work our way through the agenda, I would like to remind our listening audience that we uh, that all of the work we do is to follow the SMART uh, goals, which is uh, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time sensitive, and that uh, these have been established within the uh, district, which includes student achievement, resource alignment, and community engagement goals. Um, our first item on the agenda this evening is our district honors, recognition, gifts, and introductions, and super Intendant Smith, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Vice President of the Board. Uh, Samari Kemper. All right, so, Ms. Stewart, wait for the floor. All right. The next person is um, Anaya Vance. Okay. The next person is let's see. Oh, we're trying to speak people now, so this is interesting. <laughs> we're gonna skip down and go with um, special recognition and I need uh, Dr. Johnson to come up to the podium because we're gonna recognize our incredible special education supervisors. And um, the director of the program, uh, Ms. Tanya Bray, can you come up to the podium as well? So everybody is aware of, like almost a, a couple of years ago, March 20th is uh, when COVID came to our to our town and I would tell you that the special ed supervisors and the school psychologists have been working extremely hard to work with young kids keep them adjusted to school keep them acclimated talk to parents keep people reinforced that work is absolutely very difficult and I would have to say that uh, they never get frustrated they never seem to be uh, overwhelmed uh, at least I don't see that and uh, they really love and treat kids with kindness every single day. And so their supervisor came to me and she says, they have done an incredible job and I totally agree. And we wanted to recognize them tonight for not only their mental spirit, but also their collective effort because they work together as a very, very good team. So thank you guys for everything that you do. And she's going to recognize you, each one of you, all right? So the first one is... Um, May I have a few words, Mr. Smith? Yes. <laughs> is she like this as a supervisor all the time? <laughs> sure. She knew you were going to ask her to say something. <laughs> I thought, but afterwards. <laughs> I was prepared. Um, but um, what you stated are my sentiments as well, Mr. Smith. Um, the team that I work with is a very special team. Um, I usually like to talk off the fly, but I just wanted to make sure everything that I wanted to say, um, I was able to um, convey that today. And um, what is a team player? Because all the individuals that are going to be recognized today are true team players. A team player is someone who actively contributes to their group in order to complete tasks or meet goals. Team players are actively listening with their co-workers, respect their ideas, and aim to prove the process at hand. 
Team players understand that their team's success is their own success, and they share the responsibility with their team experiences, I'm sorry, when their team experiences difficulties along the way. Um, and, and these are six characteristics that embodies a team player, which I feel embodies um, the student services staff. Each team member understands their role. They welcome collaboration. They hold themselves accountable. They are flexible. And they maintain a positive attitude even during stressful situations. And they are committed to the team and the team's mission. This team is all of that and more. I am grateful for their professionalism and their unique, one-of-a-kind skills that makes this team effective and cohesive. Further, they are many, there are many behind the scene things that most people do not have a clue about. They meet regularly with parents, staff, students, and community members. Their passion is undeniable and their skill set is well above average. Team, thank you so much for all you do, for your commitment and dedication to the Winton Woods City communities. Wow. Your, your team is tearing up. They're, they're crying. <laughs> It has. It takes a good leader to lead Absolutely. a team to do Bravo. that. Absolutely. Bravo. It does. So before they get to come up to honor you. Thank you. Um. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, first up is Lynn Blaylock. She is one of our special education supervisors who supervises the high school and the Oaks. husband is the, is the superintendent of North College. He'll come back. He couldn't make it tonight. No, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next up is Dr. Jimmy Brown. She is the special education supervisor for the intermediate school and also middle schools grades four through eight. Next is Sally Hahn, Special Education Supervisor for grades pre-K through four. Next is Angela, Angelina Ruskin. She is the special education supervisor for all out of district um, meetings and then also John Peterson scholarships and she is also the um, hearing impaired and vision teacher, teacher. So she plays a dual role for the district. Next we have Matthew Brown. He is our school psychologist for the South Campus grades four through six. And Matt is one of our seasoned school psychologists here who has been in the district for about 20 years, 22 years. Wow, we know.
Next is Lori Burns. Take your time. She is our school psychologist for grades middle school, seven, eight, and out of district um, evaluations, as well as John Peterson scholarships. It's okay if you get me in some of these pictures because I'm on, on one side. It's all right. Next is Lisa Butts, school psychologist for high school in the Oaks. And Ms. Mrs. Butts has been here for 22 years as well. Okay, so I, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Matt Brown come back up, please. Can you get through? Okay. So years ago, and, and I hope he remembers the story, and this, this tells you about the patience of the school psychs. Uh, he was testing a, a, a young girl, and uh, do you remember the one that kept needing the coffee breaks? Okay, can you tell us the story about how that worked? I remember it, so whatever part you leave out, I have it. So she wanted some coffee. So, you know, as we took our breaks for testing, she asked if we could have a coffee break. Yes. <laughs> and she would go to her mom, and I guess when the questions became a little difficult, she would say, I, I think I need more coffee. And uh, Mr. Brown was so patient with the little girl, and uh, I, I thought it was that, that was very inspirational. She was four years old, and she needed a coffee break in her time. And I, I'm telling you, that just inspired me that this is the right guy. To, because the baby kept saying I needed the break in between. I don't know if she got better as she drunk the coffee, but yes. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Smith and board members. So. We'll bring, there are two psychs that are missing, but we'll bring them back next week, I mean next month, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to, uh, you guys can talk about how well you were recognized and they'll be anxious to come back next month. So the next one is something that we've never done before, but I saw this amazing trophy in the uh, South Campus. And these young men actually play for a uh, a league, a Forest Park League, recreational league basketball team. They are actually, they are actual superstars in my opinion. Uh, their record is 9-0, and and we'd like to recognize them for their contribution not only to our school but to our community, and I'd like to call them up one at a time. Is there a coach here? I just thought you were the designer. I didn't know you were the coach, sir. All right. <laughs> Look good, play good. So it says Southwest Ohio Basketball League Champions, Forest Park Recreational League, sixth grade basketball team, Mr. Lafayette Mack, coach, Wentwoods Intermediate School. Congratulations to the following students on capturing the 2022 Southwest Ohio Basketball League Championship title with a record of 9 and 0. Oh. Amazing. First person, Adeem Cooper. Oh, yeah. We can wait to the end. All right, turn that around so they can get your picture, sir. Oh. 
Yeah. Adeem Stat. Adeem Cooper. Okay, come on up and get a picture. You want to come up and get a picture with your son? Yes, absolutely. Yes. I have a, your dad? Yes, sir. I have a prediction. I, I, I'm usually right. He's going to be taller than you. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Baba Dia. Yes. Did you bring a, a parent with you? Come on up. I know you've been, I know you attended all those games and you cheered him on, so we have to take you all the way in. Okay, well, somebody was there. Come on. <laughs> Josiah. All right, we'll we'll save it. What about Kaylin Smith? Kyla. Okay. Dad's already there, so he's just like bring him in the in the end. <laughs> Anthony Smith? No, I'm sorry, Michael Smith. My my fault. Yeah, got that wrong. Michael Smith. Michael, question, what grade are you in, sir? Sixth grade. All right, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm very excited. We will see you again, we know. <laughs> this, next, this next young man um, sounds like he just shoots three-pointers and he's just amazing. Javier Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> you just look like that guy. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Coach Lafayette Mack. And Coach Mack, can you say a few words about the team? We actually, had, we actually got Brett. Fred Carpenter, he uh, from Corain though, but he came to help us because we needed we needed a little bit more help. Uh, but yeah, I, I wrote a few words. Uh, I uh, I started coaching basketball because it was uh, my oldest brother's legacy. Uh, it was a dream that he had. He was um, a victim of crime in July 2014. His name was Dominic McCoy. He wanted to uh, follow in our uncle's footsteps which is the head coach for TAF, DeMarco Bradley. So Natty Ayers uh, was a team name that he gave us when we was kids and we was playing. We did pretty good for the community and stuff. Um, I went to Corain at that time. And uh, <clears throat> I'm thankful to be able to mix it and make them Warriors. So um, it was a big thing when we first started. I, first off, I want to give a, a thanks to everybody involved, the parents, the parents for sure. Uh, for being so understanding with me and us, everybody in the staff, uh, keeping everybody involved, keeping our kids on track because we got a real good, great group of kids and we want to keep them on the right track, on and off the court. Uh, uh, Virgil Drinks, uh, Drinks, he was my assistant coach. Um, after a year of planning this, I had this team since they've been third graders. Um, been coaching them since third grade. COVID hit, and then it was just like, we didn't hear anything. Um, everybody thought it was crazy. They said it wouldn't work with this neighborhood. They said that the kids uh, wouldn't cling on to it. I felt like we needed to take a chance. So when I had them, I took them under my wing since third grade. We molded them, the parents, the community, uh, Mr. J for being there, 
uh, with us from the beginning and giving me this shot to show the school district what we can do. Uh, basketball is a, a team sport, and each and every one of these kids have shown that. Uh, the integrity, the accountability, the leadership that each and every one of these kids on my team have shown since I've had them, the rough times. If you don't do good outside, you don't do good in school, you don't play on the court. And that's something I've always instilled in them even in third grade. I'm proud of y'all. It's nothing else that I can say besides that. And thank the community and the school district for keeping their dream alive because it don't stop. We got games this weekend. Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah, we got games this weekend. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Is is Mr. Day is Mr. Day here? Mr. Day. He calls me and he'll be like, yeah, this so-and-so, my bus players are playing because his mom said he wasn't doing his homework. That's the kind of coach he is. He doesn't care about the basketball. That comes second ago. The schoolwork and developing these kids. And like I said, my heart just bursts. Every time he calls me, he texts me. He, he's all the like, you have my utmost respect. Right. And I am honored that the city's associated with you. And I tremendously, I, I, I thank the school for everything you've done provide these kids and provide this coach this opportunity. So thank you, and thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Can we um, give a standing ovation for this 9-0 ex excellent team? Thank you. Ms. Jackson, raise your hand so they know who you are. If the team and the parents can follow Ms. Jackson out, we'd like to get a photo on the learning stairs, something as a keepsake that we can keep and remember you, Coach. Thank you very, very much for everything you do. You know it's a winning team when you have a couple of Smiths on that team. That's all, all I know. That's true. Way to go, right? Okay, that's what I tell him. No lies detected there. <laughs> There's a Smith on there. Okay, so last month there were uh, some people missing from the, the blessing box. And we wanted to give them the opportunity to come back again. Uh, were there any members that to help paint and design the blessing box that's here tonight that, okay, come on. How many of you have ever seen, have you, have, how many of you actually seen the blessing box right in front of the Forest Park Fire Department? Very nice gesture. Thank the young people for designing the box. And we are inspired because, tell a little bit about it, Ms. Bryant, and how that came to terms. Um, so the blessing box was a collaborative effort. I'm part of a sister circle. And one day we were thinking about what can we do to help the community. Several of us live in Forest Park. Our um, sorority was chartered in Forest Park. So someone had seen a blessing box and thought, let's do that. So I reached out to Jermaine Hill, the assistant fire chief, um, who's also part of We Thrive for City of Forest Park. And he says, well, let me see what I can do. Thankfully, we have a great Home Depot in our neighborhood. They, re they said, we'll make a box for you. As a matter of fact, they made two. Um, so they made a box for us free of charge. And I thought, well, what else can we do? I want the students to be involved. So reached out, Jermaine reached out to the art director here at the city of Forest Park Schools, um, Wentwood Schools, 
and came up with an art project for young people. So they dedicated their time, their, their energy, the paint colors, and they designed the box. We didn't tell them other than, hey, put this logo on it. They came up with some creative ways to reach out to the community. So I am super thankful to be part of this initiative. Thankful for the young people who gave their time and talent. I cannot draw a stick figure, so I am in awe of the people who can draw. So thank you again. We'll have a second box coming soon for you to paint and finish. We look forward to that one as well. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you again. Okay, did we miss anyone who came with you tonight? Okay, did you bring mom with you tonight? Uh -huh. All right, so let's get, get a picture of you and mom. That would be nice. Oh, do you mean yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Trying to get your steps <laughs> in, Miss Bryant. It's like, it's like rehab, right? <laughs> Thank you again. So last month, I, I spoke about this incredible um, jazz orchestra director. And um, he blessed us by coming back tonight. Uh, we were going to keep doing this until we caught you, sir. Didn't matter. But I'd like for Mr. Habel to come up. I had the chance of hearing the band at the Red Moor you would have been extremely proud to hear how they played. And, and I can tell you the other thing that changes your value about this, this educational thing that he's on with his music is the young people, musicians are kind of shy by nature because they are into their instrument. But the young people were able to articulate, make eye contact with the professional musicians after they performed, getting tips and ideas about the next performance, how they made this particular song sound the way that it did. And you would have been very, very proud. So I'm telling you, Project Based for Learning does work. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. Appreciate it. Just a little bit on the Project Based Learning. It's really amazing how the students have taken the initiative with the Cincinnati Contemporary Jazz Orchestra. And like Mr. Smith said, we sat in on a rehearsal. They went to go talk with the musicians. And we have a student-led combo. And so this is without anything to do with me. They, five musicians, have gotten together, learned improvisation, um, and reached out to the Cincinnati Contemporary Jazz Orchestra musicians. And we sometimes joke when someone's very good at something that they wrote the book on whatever it is. So the guy who wrote the book literally on jazz piano is in the Cincinnati Contemporary Jazz Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And the students on their own have reached out to set up a session with this musician to learn how to be in a jazz combo. And so it's, uh, it's a blessing to work with these amazing students. and uh, it, it is real life experience as, as real as you can get. So thank you. And, and it was standing room only and you couldn't find a parking space and it was just a packed house. And seeing the young, young people perform in school was one thing, but seeing them at this establishment, the Red Moor, a professional establishment where they know jazz musicians from all over the world have played, gave them a whole sense of courage and enthusiasm about their work. And hopefully we'll get other opportunities to see the, the young people perform. Yep. So thank you, thank sir, you so for, much. for your leadership. It. Appreciate thank you. you. Thank you, thank you too. You. Mr. Habel, if you could pass on a great message to Ms. Kelsey Domain, we're going to keep calling her name until she comes to, these, to, this, to this board meeting. All right, we'll see her next month. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Thank you, Superintendent Smith, and we'd like to uh, say thank you and congratulations to everyone that was recognized here. We appreciate all the community support um, is from the teachers, administrators, and, and everything that's happening in the school district. We love to hear and see these types of things every, every time we have a, we have a board meeting. Um, I believe I say for the entire board, we, we really do say thank you to everybody involved and, uh, and really appreciate what you're doing. Um, and with that, the next item on our agenda is a recess, so we will take a five-minute recess. So we're going to go ahead and resume our um, board meeting.
Um, there were no requests turned in for public comments, so we're going to move to, uh, do we have a re representative from the Wynton Woods Teachers Association here tonight? Oh, please. I really don't have any comments. Okay. Well, thank you for, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, and then do we have an OPSI re representative, as I see we do? Good evening, Madam President, Madam, or excuse me, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Vice President and Board Member. I've been called worse, that's fine. <laughs> My apology, Jeff. And that was just today. <laughs> On the behalf of OC members and myself, we would just like to say thank you for giving us this honor to be here. And we're just so proud of our students. And we're, we're just here to support our students. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you showing up, coming. Uh, next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Uh, board, unless you see any necessary changes to these minutes, a motion would be in order. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. I second that motion. It has been motioned and seconded. Are there any questions or discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Seymour, will you call the vote? Mrs. Kidd? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Birdie? Aye. Ms. Bryant? Aye. Dr. Johnson? Aye. The vote passes unanimously. Our next item on the agenda is 7.01, our Treasury Report of the Financial Statements for February of 2022. Certainly. For the uh, month ending of February of 22, uh, the general fund had year-to-date revenues of $39.8 million, uh, month-to-date revenues of $11.8 million which basically existed because we had our real estate tax settlement in the month of Feb uh, February. Also, our year-to-date expenditures are at $33.4 million in the general fund, and we're running currently 3% under budget, or about $1.6 million. As you know, this is slightly less than last year, but we tried to streamline our budget and participation of our uh, impending levy, so the budget was restricted this year compared to prior years with reductions and things. So that's why the uh, projected uh, year-to-date uh, under budget would be slightly less than last year. Also, uh, all funds had a total of $47.4 million. $21 million was general fund. $2.5 million still remains in our building fund. And $15 million in classroom facilities ending the month of February. That's basically a summary of the financials ending February of 2022. Thank you, Mr. Seymour. Uh, with no objections being heard, let the financial statements for the month of February 2022 be, be submitted for audit. Next item, next item on the agenda is 8.01, Treasurer's recommendations for the investments for February of 2022. Yes, for the investments, our investments for the month of February, we had 38.5 million invested. The uh, general fund earned $16,300 and classroom facilities earned $767. As you're all aware, the interest rates are very low right now and all investments are liquidated within our classroom facilities account to cash and cash equivalents. <clears throat> so our total, uh, interest earnings were at $16,300 in all funds for the month of February. Thank you, Mr. Seymour. A board motion is in order. I'd like to make a motion to approve the investment report as presented. I'll second it. It has been motioned and seconded. Are there any questions or discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Seymour, will you please call the vote? Mrs. Kuhn? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Birdie? Aye. Ms. Bryant? Aye. Dr. Johnson? Aye. Our next item on the agenda is 8.02, the re resolution authorizing the issuance of classroom facilities refunding bonds. Mr. Seymour, you have the floor. Um, basically, for about uh, a couple months now, we've been working with financial advisors and brokers to take a look at our debt structure, just like you would take a look at your home mortgage to see if it would be advantageous to refinance any of your debt. 
it uh, appeared, uh, we started the process about eight weeks ago, and that we were advised by our financial advisors, Bradley Payne, and our brokers who are RBG capital investors, that it would be advantageous for the district to take a look at some of their bonds that are long term. Uh, we're looking at bonds that don't mature for several years from now, our later maturing bonds. And at the time, it was determined that we should probably proceed with some refinancing of some of these bonds, just like you would on your house. But with bonds, you can refinance certain years of maturity, whereas with the home mortgage, you're refinancing this period clear on through. So we still had some bonds that were callable in the late part of the issue uh, into the years of 2020. 2040s, the 2040s, because our bonds don't mature for 38 years. So we, in taking a look at it, we have we decided to proceed. Um, Mr. Birdie has been involved. We have met with financial advisors and financial brokers. And uh, most recently, uh, this past week, we had a review by Standard & Poor's. We had to do special presentations. Mr. Smith, myself, Mr. Birdie, and our financial advisors all were on calls with Standard & Poor's. They have no in-person reviews right now. And we're happy to announce that yesterday we just received the word that we maintained our rating of AA minus. AA minus is fairly good for a school district this size and a school district uh, that currently is not floating a large cash balance. So. Uh, in the state of Ohio, all bonds are backed by voted millage, but Standard & Poor's doesn't care. Right. They don't pay any attention to the fact that your, uh, your payments are backed by millage. They only look at what your general fund and your forecast and mm -hmm. what your current financial statement looks like. So we had to go through a very long task of presentation um, with that. And um, currently, even today, we had a pre-sale meeting around 3 o'clock. We decided to go ahead with the process because the market is, gra is very quickly uh, volatile. With Ukraine and what's going on with interest rates, we moved the sales, projected sales up to tomorrow. The board's going to adopt tonight, and they're going to try to go to market tomorrow. It is very possible if something happens overnight that makes this not a good idea our financial advisors going to halt but we do the only what one good thing we will have got out of it even if we halt the process is we maintained our rating and at some point we may go back to take a look at it but as of 3 30 they all thought we should go ahead and proceed and um, the potential savings if we proceed based on the market as it stood at three o'clock would be two and a half million dollars so that's uh, a savings, you know, over the life of the, till those maturity take place. So if all proceeds as planned, tomorrow we will try to go to market. Tomorrow morning, first thing, I've got to get this resolution filed. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, Mr. Birdie might be able to add something, or Mr. Smith, because all three of us were part of the process. I, I think you explained it well. I mean, it would be similar to any one of us going out and refinancing our house because the interest rates are below where we're currently at in our market mortgage. It's not going to save us two and a half million dollars tomorrow, but no. it saves us two and a half million dollars over the life of the bonds, which is real money. And we're trying to do what we're supposed to do as far as being good stewards of the taxpayer money. So um, I, I've got a chance to sit in on those meetings with Standard and Poor's and the investment advisors and the attorneys. And I saw the magnitude of information that was have to, that was pulled together by them to uh, to be able to present this to Standard and Poor's, and it was a uh, a fairly monumental effort. So I think everybody did a great job, especially to maintain the rating that we had in this environment. I think uh, is is a is a positive for the district. So yeah, I think that's you. that's one of the major pieces. Um, we've all experienced COVID for two years, and to maintain the rating that we have was absolutely monumental. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know if it was going to get to that level, but I'm very, very proud of the work that we've done and, and we are there. Yep. Very good. Um, the re resolution is very lengthy. 
So if I could just summarize the resolution for you, I would hope that you would not want to read it. Um, but basically, uh, you're giving uh, me permission on the maximum principal that I could uh, refinance, which is approximately $21 million. Um, you're giving us the ability to refund those bonds and out of savings to the taxpayers. Um, we're not lengthening the time of the loan. Uh, we're just refinancing some of our payments. And it also is giving us a certificate of award, <coughs> which gives basically the board is giving Dr. Johnson and I the authority <coughs> to go ahead and sign all those documents. <coughs> when you have a house closing, you notice all these documents that spread clear down through the table. Well, imagine a closing on $20 million and a slide. So Dr. Johnson and I will have a signing party, and you're, ba you're giving us permission to go ahead and sign on the behalf of the Board of Education. Thank you, Mr. Seymour. Um, a board motion is in order. I would like to make a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the issuance of classroom facilities, unlimited tax general obligation, refunding bonds, series 2022, as tax exempt or as taxable obligations <coughs> in UNO or more series of bonds in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $20,150,000, authorizing the execution of the bond purchase agreement appropriate for the sale of the bonds, authorizing the execution of paying agent certification or certificate of award <coughs> containing the final uh, terms of the bond, authorizing the distribution of an official statement and authorizing the execution of an escrow <coughs> deposit agreement securing the refunded bonds and related matters as presented. I second that motion. It has been motioned and seconded. Are there any additional questions or discussion? I appreciate the time and the energy that was put in and the importance um, that we are good stewards of the public monies and that we want to make full advantage of every single dollar that their taxpayers pay and for the benefit of our students and what we can do to benefit them. So I appreciate the extra works. I know it was, uh, as Jeff said, monumental and Herculean maybe task. And we appreciate the uh, preservation of the standard and poor's rating too. That helps with our future borrowing as well. It keeps us in good standing. Well, uh, we are pretty much, uh, we, not that we, want we to committed to standard <coughs> reports that we would not borrow. That well, we yes. have met our master facilities master plan right. and shared with them that our business manager has already anything that he has done. He has the funds to uh, proceed with the renovation of our early childhood center. So they are aware that we will not be out for any more additional debt. But that did help us our interest rate. Being yes. Good. That yes. that was more. It, of the it point. will help. It will help the interest rate. Yeah. yeah. We wind up. That's design. that's what I was looking for. Yeah. All right. Without any further discussion, Mr. Seymour, will you call the vote? Mrs. Coon. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Birdie. Aye. Ms. Bryant. Aye. Dr. Johnson. Aye. Vote passes unanimously. The next item on the agenda is 9.01, the reports of the superintendent for the school reports. Mr. Smith, you have the floor. Yes, sir, Mr. Birdie and uh, board. Uh, the first thing, um, great announcement. Uh, every senior would want to know this. There are 53 days until graduation. <laughs> so they're very, very excited. They're getting ready for a whole lot of different events. But Mrs. Denny, can you come up and give some of the other special events that uh, we could have sent this out to you electronically, but we'd like for the public to see it so that they can attend some of these events as well. Yeah, and I'm going to have a little cheat sheet behind me that you, it might look familiar to you because we do sit it out every Friday um, through our one call now system. But we do have the spring musical coming up, which is very exciting. Um, it is going to be Matilda, and that is going to be on April 8th, 9th, and 10th. Um, and then we also have midterm, which is very important. We always remind our uh, parents about that so that they can check in with their students' academic progress. And that's going to be on April 14th. Um, and then getting into May, which is going to be pretty busy, we do have on May, I believe it is May 6th, we have our academic signing. So we bring in all our seniors in that have the 
um, the honors diploma and we have a really special ceremony for them and then the following Friday is when we bring them in for the really nice dinner that uh, our superintendents top scholar top honors um, honors diploma dinner and then we have let's see oh I did miss prom prom is going to be um, April 22nd at Paul Brown Stadium yeah one thing about the prom <coughs> there were um, several districts that uh, booked Paul Brown Stadium for their prom for last year and um, up for two years ago as well. And we decided to leave our funds there based on the work of uh, Principal Martin and Mr. Seymour to not move the funds uh, and still keep them as a deposit. Uh, Paul Brown went up um, tremendously. Um, I don't know if it's because the Bengals were winning so much, but they went up on everything. I know that uh, Brandon can probably tell you that every price has gone up, but our price stayed the same because we left our deposit there. So we were good stewards again of the funds. Uh, it's going to be a great event at Paul Brown Stadium. The kids are very excited, but our price did not increase. And of course, graduation is on May 19th, and then the last day for students is May 20th. Last day for teachers is May 23rd. Yes. Make sure you come to see Matilda. It will be an award-winning performance. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions or anybody have any issues? Okay. We'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the uh, 9.02 Transportation T1 report. Mr. Smith, you have the floor. Yes, Mr. Birdie. Uh, I'm going to have Mr. Denny come up because he's going to talk a little bit about miles per by service, uh, people by service, and then the trend data summary for transportation. Thanks, Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. Good evening, board. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. So uh, you should have had before you in the agenda uh, several PDFs, I think three reports. And these are taken directly from the T reports, the state, uh, the Ohio Department of Education, this transportation. Um, really, it's for funding, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, it is about keeping score because the state does provide uh, transportation offsets to all 609 districts in the state, Wynton Woods, of course, being one of them. So you should have had a report of pupils by service type, which gives an overview of the different uh, school backgrounds or school uh, choices that different families make and how those students ride our transportation or interact with our transportation system. Um, and you also should have had a report that shows miles by service type. And so if you work out the, the, the daily miles times 180 school days, it comes close to about 600,000 miles a year our buses roll. And that doesn't include field trips and it doesn't include summer school. So uh, we're probably in the 700,000 mile range per year typically. Um, last year, if any of you recall this or saw it or were aware of it, it looked very different, and we'll touch on that in a moment. That's because of COVID. Uh, this data is based on what we used to call count week, which is the first full week in October. It used to be that was attendance and funding for uh, per pupils. Uh, per pupil funding was that, that uh, the holdover is transportation still does that. So you do head counts and so forth. Uh, make sure you get an accurate count of everybody riding the buses on those days. So some of the highlights, just things that maybe uh, jumped out at you, the things that I noticed, <clears throat> is we do have uh, an increase in number of students and families participating in transportation um, this year. Um, we saw, uh, let's see, 242 students, for example, um, rode our buses and went to non-public schools. So you can see that on the per pupil by service type. Um, 82 riders went to community schools, also called charter schools. Uh, but a total of 25,045 uh, of our students, that is, Wynwood students that attend Wynwood schools, rode our school buses. Um, 123 uh, students uh, participated that would be designated special education. And so that means it's in their IEP. Certainly a lot more students in our district um, qualify for special education services, but these are students that have it in their IEP to have transportation services. Um, miles by service type, we touched on that. Um, another thing you can see there is that we do operate 38 buses. Um, so that is the current fleet that this district uh, owns and operates and maintains. Um, so that is a quick summary of those two reports, and those have been submitted to the state as of January. Um, so we're awaiting their approval. Um, the last report you would see is just trend data. Uh, this is the so what factor. 
like, okay, you see a bunch of numbers. How does it relate overall over time to uh, past data? And so that's what the, t the T1 trend data report shows. And again, as you can see, we had a drastic drop in 2021. Uh, we went from 2,507 riders in 2020 to 263, a 90% drop roughly. Uh, but again, that was because of COVID. At the time, we had very few students riding because we were almost entirely remote learning, virtual. Um, 2022 jumped up again to 2,700, 2,766 riders. So um, you could basically see the total number of riders, um, what educational background those students have, and then also what types of busing or transportation modes are involved. Happy to entertain any questions you might have. Do you have a question? Yes, ma'am. The payment in lieu of, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, great question. So payment in lieu of is for families who do not attend our schools proper. So they don't attend a Winton Woods school. They elect to attend um, a non-public school. And the law basically says, <clears throat> Ohio Revised Code says, within a 30 mile, excuse me, 30 minute drive time radius, um, the district's responsible for transporting those students. So an example of a very, you know, fairly well attended non-public school would be uh, Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon is within the 30 minute drive radius. So the district's responsible for providing transport to those students because we provide transport now for our high school students, we have to also provide like service for non-public students. That's a mouthful, sorry. But no, basically, if the district steps back and says we can't afford to put a bus, say maybe there's two kids at a particular school and it doesn't financially make sense, the district is authorized under state law to offer those, actually we're required to offer those families payment in lieu of, which means it's we can't transport you, but we'll give you money as compensation for transporting your own child. So, so long answer to yeah, a short the, question. The other, the other part of this, Brian, is... Uh, thank you for the explanation. Sure. When we transport, like he mentioned Roger Bacon, if we transport those kids, that means if we transport our own, we have to transport them as well. It can't be a situation where we transport our students and we leave out Roger Bacon or Moeller right. or anyone else. So it's part of the law, it's part of the group that we have to adhere to the rights. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I appreciate the question. That's a great question. Thank you. Are there any other, any other questions? Did the ridership go up with the adding of the high school back into the education? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, great point. That's exactly what we theorize happened. So it's a good benefit that the high schoolers had that transportation? Yes. That's good. Yeah, not only safety, but ultimately, you know, we're utilizing resources. Mm -hmm. And then there is an increase in state offset cost for funding for that as well. And improved attendance. Right, that's what, yeah, that's yes. an excellent point. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Denny. You might, want to, you. You might want to stay there. Uh, <laughs> next you. item on the agenda is the facilities update. Mr. Smith <laughs> or yes. Mr. Denny, uh, you have a floor. <laughs> Mr. Denny, we've been working with <coughs> SHP with a design package for the <coughs> intermediate building. And as Mr. Seymour mentioned, we're moving on with this project without going back to taxpayers again for uh, renovating a building, which was you know, our plan from the beginning until so we're able to I realize that plan by using ESSER funds, some other uh, governmental funds to make it a reality. Uh, so, Mr. D. Yeah, thanks again, Mr. Smith. So just the facilities update, uh, just briefly, North Campus, South Campus, um, we're continuing to work on warranty items. Those really are winding down. We're basically working our way through those um, with the contractors that are involved. Um, so that's wrapping up. We're really increasingly turning our attention to the demolitions. Uh, Primary South is probably 95, 98% gone. Um, there's just some asphalt left and some ground clearing and then they need to regrade and put topsoil down. The elementary school is probably about 75 to 80% complete. It's just what they need to call um, uh, off-site hauling. They need to basically start hauling all that uh, off to des designated landfills. Um, so those demolition projects are getting close. Um, and as Mr. Smith mentioned, our, our focus now is on the renovation of the intermediate school, the former intermediate school. <clears throat> and uh, turning that into a uh, really uh, first-rate early childhood campus to serve our, our youngest students, our preschoolers and our kindergartners. Um, so that design process is still ongoing um, and the abatement is complete. So that's a milestone in the process that, um, again, the, the, the money for this was in the bond under the facilities master plan that Mr. Seymour alluded to earlier 
and paid for in in 49 percent of it was paid for by the state of ohio so this is a, a windfall for the the community for the district for the taxpayers really uh, mr smith actually asked me to share just some photos so you have a visual of what the school looks like now the majority of the asbestos um, is in the mastic or glue under the floor tile and it's also in the cove base so when you look around the baseboard of the of the room that that gray strip you see that's all all over the building in the classrooms and the hallway that mastic or glue also contains asbestos because when the building was built they thought that was well it's just what you did that was best practice at the time um, it is flame flame retardant so that was one of the things that they valued then so this is actually the cafeteria at the intermediate school uh, you can see what it looks like now we are of course storing some items there but basically you see the tiles gone so it looks quite a bit different. Um, that wasn't that good. <laughs> Technology's great when it works. <laughs> and when I can figure out how to work it. So this is just a view of a hallway. Again, you can see more of the same. So you're seeing a lot of concrete. This does open up options for later that we'll study and, of course, engage people about what type of flooring would we like to have eventually. That's part of the design process. There's pros and cons, um, finished concrete, sealed concrete, or some other type of resilient floor surface. Um, but again, you could just get a general idea of what the building is, is looking like now. That is the media center. So it looks a little different. We've spent some quality time in there, I know. Um, but the shelving is removed, and then also the, uh, the tile is also gone. This is one of the large classrooms. I believe it's 113, 115, one of the double rooms. And then that is room 160, I believe, or 156. Um, so that is uh, one of the large classrooms located near the entry of the building. That's basically just a, a quick visual. You see most of the abatement work uh, is visible in the flooring. And that's where the bulk of the asbestos was located. Mr. Smith, I hopefully hit all the high points. Hit the, the major points. I, I think that um, when you see the, the, the way this renovation project is gonna work, uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do and we hope that uh, when we have these public meetings that the public does come out and participate like they did for the new facilities uh, We're going to really be relying on Miss Stiles to give us some ideas about because there are some amenities in the south and north campus That I know she would want the littles to have in this particular building so that when you look at our our facilities None of them will look out of date. They will look like they were very intentional to make them work collectively together so that when our kids transition to each building they're, they can say that they are familiar with what we've had before. I have to caution you, uh, I know that there is a very popular part of both campuses, uh, which are the learning stairs. I doubt if the learning stairs will make it in this intermediate building because you would have to kind of go through the roof. <laughs> so, uh, but here's the other part that we promised taxpayers. We promised taxpayers years ago, um, six years ago, Ms. Denny, that we would not uh, build a separate facility for uh, administration. The administrative building will be right in the ECC where the littles are, the primary uh, kids. Uh, and so it gives us that kind of shoulder lean where we can uh, connect with our little kids and see them grow and flourish uh, right in the same administrative building. So there will not be a new central <coughs> office built. Central office will be where the primary kids live. All right. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Smith. You. Thank you, Mr. Denny. Uh, we're always uh, excited to hear about the progress in the building, so looking forward to uh, that building being done at some point. Um, next item on the agenda is 10.01, which are personnel schedules under the superintendent, superintendent's recommendations. Mr. Smith, you have the floor. Yes, uh, <coughs> Mr. Vice President and Board, I am going to um, ask to approve the personnel schedules as presented. A would, would, would be resignations, B would be uh, certificated appointments, C would be certificated appointments as well. I will defer D to the HR director when it's time and schedule E, which would be personnel employments uh, 
for certificated, no, sorry, leaves. There are two D schedules. Yes. And that's intentional. So uh, D, sorry. Good evening. Uh, there is a D um, which has everything except for summer school. Um, that is under the superintendent's recommendation. And there's also a D under a separate section, um, which is D supplementals for summer school, which would be under my recommendation. And I can explain um, when we get to that provision. Okay, so we'll go through Mr. Smith's recommendations on the schedules okay. first. Uh, board, a motion would be in order. I'll make a motion to approve the personnel schedules as presented. I'll second. It has been motioned and seconded. Now, are there any questions or discussions <coughs> about Mr. Smith's personnel schedules? Just, and you, the D's are separate, entirely different. Okay, right. I just want to make entirely. sure. Entirely. Anything else? Mr. Seymour, will you call the vote? Mrs. Kuhn? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Birdie? Aye. Ms. Bryant? Aye. Dr. Johnson? Aye. All right, next item on the agenda will be 11.01, .01, which is the personnel schedule D summer school under the executive director of HR and legal recommendations. Okay, thank you. Uh, the reason for this um, change is because uh, we, it was brought to our attention of a potential um, um, violation of law where um, uh, a, an employee may not have an interest in a contract. And so on this schedule, uh, there is an employee who also happens to be related to the superintendent that we are seeking approval for. As part of our correction, corrective action that we submitted to the state um, when this was brought to our attention uh, for some past um, missteps, uh, we assured the state that we would um, in the future um, ensure that any uh, recommendations involving staff me staff members that were related to the superintendent to be um, a, um, recommended by someone other than him. And so in that case, that is why um, the recommendation is coming from me and we're doing it with full transparency. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Well, I think we probably need to put a motion on the floor first and then we can have discussion and questions. Okay. So board a motion would be in order. Motion to approve the personnel schedules as presented. The supplemental schedule um, personnel for certified and uncertified personnel. I'll second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Um, I know I have a I have a question. Why why <coughs> would we put everybody on the summer school on this with your recommendation? Why wouldn't it only just be the person? who's related to the superintendent? Uh, well, there's a level of privacy. everybody else isn't, yeah. there, there's not any violation of law of having everybody else on the other schedule. No, we, we didn't want to single any one employee out, so we just kept it as a group, all summer, all summer school um, recommendations. Because, uh, you know, not everyone wants everyone to know they're related to the boss. <laughs> That's a, a, an interesting position to be in, uh, I'm sure. You know, there's probably some pride in that, but you know, some people prefer their privacy. Any other questions? Mr. Seymour, will you call the vote? Mrs. Kuhn? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Birdie? Uh, no, nay. Ms. Bryant? I'll abstain. Dr. Johnson. Aye. Uh, vote passes. <clears throat> Thank you. Two to three. Yep. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda, I believe, is the open. Are we, well, we didn't do the open enrollment policy. We need to do the open enrollment policy. Back to Mr. Smith. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So. Uh, Ms. Wilson, are there any changes uh, that the board needs to be aware of? Uh, I know there was some red lettering that you wanted to uh, articulate as it relates to open enrollment. Yes, so before you, you have a copy of the open 
enrollment policy, and this is something that is approved each year. Uh, we work collaboratively with um, student services and also um, some other administrators in the district to um, refine our policy based on feedback. Um, we've tried it a couple of ways. We've had like hard deadlines where we've said that open enrollment ends, starts and ends at a certain time. And then we've also had sort of a rolling admissions policy because what inevitably happens is we have kids that move in, they've got great reasons for wanting to be here, namely our project-based learning. And if they're beyond the deadline, in order to admit them, we sort of had to break our own policy. So this is an attempt to rectify that and what we're making clear is that open enrollment is ongoing. However, we have a priority, um, kind of a, an open enrollment season where people are given priority if they enroll at a certain time. So if you look at the bottom of page one, you'll start to see some red lettering uh, that highlights the changes so that it's crystal clear um, that we ask students that are intending to enroll, remain here on open enrollment just to prove residency each year. They don't have to re-enroll like they used to have to, but they do have to prove residency so that we can ensure that we continue to get the funding for them. Um, and then beginning April 1st, we'll begin promoting open enrollment for the new school year. And if we get um, applications before uh, May 31st, we'll give those applications priority. But we are not cutting it off. You can open enroll at any time during the school year. One of the things that we realized, um, through no fault of their own, young people don't have the ability to determine where they're going to live. That's a parental decision. And since we have a unique program, project-based learning, uh, many of our kids have, uh, our parents have decided to move to more affordable housing to different communities. And we'd like for the students to be able to stay at Wentwood City Schools, even though we don't provide transportation, that unique educational experience is something that you could only get here. So having an open enrollment opportunity for those people, those young people, actually makes the best decision. It's not as overt as people think it is. It's more based on the transitional behavior of our families that will tell you at the very last minute, we have to move. And the question often comes up, can we stay? <coughs> The rest of the policy that isn't in red for the new board members, um, there are protections in the policy that um, dictate that we give priority to our resident students. So um, open enrollment is capped um, for kids if we don't have space. So we try not to incur additional cost by taking on kids from other districts. So if we, for example, if we have to hire a teacher, we typically say no because that's a cost that taxpayers you know, probably don't want to incur. That's already in our policy. We also have um, statutory reasons for denying open enrollment, such as um, if they've committed certain crimes, they're not allowed to open enroll, or if they've had certain disciplinary um, infractions in other districts or other communities, uh, we can deny open enrollment. So that's all spelled out already. That's nothing new, but it is in our existing policy. The red part is us, the new information. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Um, board of motion is in order? Or did we already do it? No. Okay. Already did. No All right, Mr. Seymour, will you call the vote? No. No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no,
their families pay taxes. Um, I, I'm not real keen on the rolling kind of a concept of it. Like I said, I, I appreciate preserving a student that's been a, in the district and their family had to move and giving them an option to stay. Uh, I think that's um, fair and equitable. But I, I don't know about the rolling or the, I still don't understand how that concept kind of works. Well, the allowing a student whose family moves during the year to stay is open enrollment. So they would stay under this policy. So otherwise, under um, residency laws in Ohio, they would be required to withdraw and move to their new district. No, I understand that. Yeah. I understand that concept and that phrase or that clause itself would be mm -hmm. agreeable to me. But you would define something as an open enrollment, not necessarily defined by a student who exists in our district, but somebody that could decide to come at a later date at any time during the school year. And I think that'd be very hard for teachers, in my opinion, because uh, we may end up having to hire another teacher without some kind of a forecast, because we don't really know oh, well, we, how our students. We limit um, class size. So we have our contract has class size caps on it. And then what we do is we, um, we preserve seats. So for example, the first couple years that we did this, everyone wanted all day kindergarten, whether or not they intended to ever remain beyond kindergarten was, you know. So what we quickly realized is that we need to just close, we're not even gonna really offer um, much open enrollment for kindergarten because that was one that filled up quickly and these were not people that were truly interested in our program, they were interested in all day kindergarten for their kids. This, this is just one example. And that's written in there that way? I mean, not, that not currently, but and this is one back a few years ago. So our correction was um, we started to, uh, we just close it very quickly. So we allow, um, you know, a few seats um, and we talk to the principals every spring. We have a meeting and we talk to the principals. We see how many kids are rolling up from preschool. We see how many seats we have available. And if it doesn't look like we have, you know, enough seats to accommodate potential um, district residents, um, based on you know what we think is rolling up and what might move in we just simply close the grade level so right now if someone called right now they would find out that we are not open enrolling anyone from grades I think seven through nine were closed and that's because we know that we are you know approaching or we're at a point where we don't want to offer we're at, we call it at capacity but that doesn't mean we're full it means that we are preserving seats for uh, what we call native or residents um, of the district in case they move in at a later date. And Mr. Seymour may be able to give us uh, the exact dollar, but the open enrolled student does not come here for free. No, I, I, don't, I don't think they come here for free. No, they do not come here for free. Well, no, I, I, I'm sure they yeah. don't. But uh, what I'm saying is, though, I do <coughs> worry about having to incur an extra teacher during the course of the year because we might, well, I just want to be reassured in a, in a policy and then if we do make up another policy, I don't want us not to follow the policy yeah. that we set. No, do you that, know what I mean? I uh, totally okay. know what you mean. That's why we are revising the policy. Because there were lots of people that asked for exceptions. And, you know, that became very problematic. And, you know, we were constantly finding ourselves in like kind of defense mode or adversarial roles with people that were like, look, I just want to come because I think you, I heard you had a great program. Now I don't like you or I'm mad at you yeah, because no. you're, yeah. you're being, you know. Yeah, and the other, the other part that we have to really be very careful about is um, there are many parents that come with more than one child. Mm -hmm. So right. having an open enrolled seventh grader where there is space and we have to deny the eighth grader or the ninth grader, we've had to do it before because we don't have enough space to accommodate that other kid. Uh, without opening up another or, or opening up another section or hiring another teacher. So in your opinion, the way we broke the rule was mainly I, for students that, no, well, I'm just trying to understand yeah, it. Don't, I don't want you to think that we broke the rule. What I'm saying is there were all kinds of people that wanted to enroll before the date, after the date, and we felt we were constantly having to defend our position. So what we tried to do is we tried to amend it. So each year, we, we have to bring this to the board each year. So we've tried it different ways. So I think the past policy had a hard and fast deadline. This policy does not. It gets rid of that deadline so that we don't have to 
find ourselves in a position where we're bumping up against an artificial deadline, and then we have kids that, you know, we've got classrooms that aren't completely full, and we've got kids that would be a good fit for our program. But it's, it, this is not my recommendation. This is a collaborative recommendation from your principals, teaching and learning, um, and also some of our enrollment specialists in the district. So, if, you know, I'm happy to take your feedback back to the committee if the will of the board is to do something different. But this is not, I don't want you to think this is Courtney right. Wilson's oh, no, recommendation. No, I, it, you're just, and you're, you're voting just, on something that yeah. I'm endorsing. No, this, no, it's, this not was, a, it's not a personal thing. I I just this is question. what the team thought was best. I'm not very loud, but I have a question. I, I thought I understood the open, um, the open-ended process, the ongoing process is like, say, if a family moves into the neighborhood, you need to leave space in, like, say, the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. So that's why you freeze those. Yes, we freeze. Right. Right. So if somebody moves into the neighborhood and you need a seat, so you don't fill it up to capacity. Correct. So I, I mean, that's the way I understood the inter-district open Yes, and Dr. Johnson, that one's, ongoing. that's, yeah, that's not optional. No, that's that, you that's have not to optional. Take so I'm not yeah. saying we're breaking okay. our rule by putting somebody else in that classroom, even though you've already announced that it's closed. It's closed because you're saving those seats. It's closed in to, case somebody, to outsiders. To outsiders. Oh, that's not to residents. I, can, yeah, I think that's the point. It. I mean, and I so, yeah, you're right, no, you're right. No, no, you can't close it to our district residents. No. But They're what happens, saying. what happens time to time, uh, because when people move into the neighborhood, it's a, it's a closed neighborhood. It's a very mm -hmm. close-knit neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's how many residents are in the, the area. So when they hear your kid got in, they don't understand your kid moved in. They don't understand my kid didn't get in because I still live in one of the surrounding communities in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. I can't get into Winton Woods. So their piece is they want to make a petition. Well, remember, a lot of people bring their own relatives. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of people that work in the district and their children go to, the, to Winton Woods as well. Many of them don't live in the district. Right, so they follow the policy. So the, 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 the plan, the, yeah, but so the, the piece that Dr. Johnson and Ms. Wilson mentioned is that we leave space intentional because <laughs> I can guarantee you there will be someone moving in. Right. There will be someone moving in with a relative. There will be a kid coming from another country that lives in Forest Park, Springfield Township, or Green Hills. That's my concern why I don't necessarily want to have a rolling open enrollment. But that's why you need it. It's rolling naturally. No, there's no I, 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 think, I think the concern is the, the, yeah. the, way, the way I hear it <coughs> is you leave space, and that's, that's the way it ought to happen. I think that's the perfect, mm -hmm. the perfect way to do it. I think the concern is the number of people moving in in any one grade for anything is really an unknown. So if you had a large influx, then are we, are we at a risk of having to hire a teacher because now we have one or two too many students that take it over capacity based on teacher contracts? I mean, that, that would be that's how I, like, how I would phrase concern. the concern. Mm -hmm. right. and, it, and if you tell me that doesn't happen because of the amount of space that you leave, that's, that's the answer. And I can't tell you that it's, that it, that it's happened. Okay. Because the one that we really safeguard more so than anything else, we already know the number 712. We're already ahead of that one, so we don't even bother that one anymore. The one that would have been the most concern, as Ms. Wilson mentioned earlier, was the kindergarten students. And we didn't want our district to be a pass-through right where you're only coming for all-day kindergarten, but you have no intention of coming back for first grade. That's not good for our system. And so we are very, very protective of it so that our uh, teachers don't get overburdened. Uh, teachers are actually able to work with 150 students per uh, day per in high school, correct? Right. All right. So that's the, it's a contractual number that actually supports the work that we do. Okay. So, and. Well, and I'll just mention one other thing. Um, it's also a great recruiting tool for me. Um, to be able to tell a teacher, um, oh, you can bring your child to school with you. Like some, a lot of people have kids that um, go to other school districts, young kids, or that might want to come. So if we're hiring someone after a deadline, you know, that's in spring, and we hire them over the summer, it's great to be able to say, well, you can you can bring your child to school here because ideally, you know, we would love for all of our staff members to bring their kids here because you know then they've got some skin in the game, you know, in terms of. Our programming so those are some reasons that we've talked about over the years and like I said this um, document has evolved 
and this is the latest version based on our best thinking at this time. And you know, you'll have an opportunity to look at it again next year with additional feedback from everyone involved if, if there are problems or overages or, or anything like that. Um, you know, we can certainly give you a report and share that and you know, make adjustments as needed. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So with open enrollment, and I'm just asking a question of how it works. Mm -hmm. So if somebody from outside the district wants to come in to our district mm -hmm. with open enrollment, at any point in time, we can say no, correct? Or are we obligated to say yes? You can say no for certain reasons. For certain reasons. Yeah. Okay. And, it's, and it has to be consistent with our policy. Okay. So it's like if it's a certain crimes, certain disciplinary infractions in other districts within certain time frames, um, if we're at capacity, um, all of those reasons listed at the very beginning, the restrictions. So despite rolling open enrollment, capacity is one of the reasons we can, okay. And that's the most often cited, truthfully. Like most kids come, are great kids, we'd love to have them, but sometimes we're full, or we think we're going, to, we're approaching a point where we have to re, um, preserve seats for our resident, for our residents. And we're confident that the, um, the numbers of seats that we have reserved or set aside uh, for our what I'll call in district uh, students is a safe number. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. Cool. Yep. But nice. do we really know that since we hypothetically haven't opened it, roll we haven't rolled it out, so it's still an unknown. Uh, no, we watch it, and like I told you, we've been burned. Like the, we've learned from past mistakes. So that kindergarten situation where we didn't have cap, like a cap there, we and or we weren't. You know, I don't know how it happened, but we had a year or two where it seemed like there there were problems. Teachers were complaining, principals were complaining, and so we've adjusted. So every time we notice a problem, we adjust, we modify the policy, and we bring it to you for approval. Mm -hmm. So this is our best thinking today based on feedback that we've gotten. So I'm confident that we're getting closer to um, where we want to be with our open enrollment policy. But we do monitor it. So and we. Uh, trust me, principals and their secretaries watch class sizes, and even our teachers association, um, they watch class size like a hawk because they don't, you know, they get upset when we're overloaded and God forbid it be a kid that's from somewhere else that's pushing us over. So. All right. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Mr. Smith. Um, any other questions? Discussion? No? Mr. Seymour, will you call the vote, please? Mrs. Kuhn? Nay. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Birdie? Aye. Ms. Bryant? Aye. Dr. Johnson? Aye. Thank you. This is one against four. Four. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the legislative report. Ms. Kuhn? Um, yes, I appreciate uh, Mr. Smith's help on uh, collecting some of the data. Um, in particular, uh, one event, it just doesn't affect us, but it has to do with the overall May 3rd primary, of which we have a school ballot issue on the, on the docket for us to look at. Um, there is concern with the redistricting that local candidates won't be on that uh, primary. There will be, however, the local issues, local ballot issues, the statewide, uh, that includes candidates for statewide congressional and local offices, and then the local ballot issues, but not the um, congressional, state of Ohio congressional candidates because of the issues with redistricting. Uh, did you have some more to offer on that? No, you can go on and add the uh, piece as it relates to the, the transportation issues that the committee's yes. been working on. Right, and then that piece is very important too, is, uh, and I know Mr. Smith's been working on a, a special group and heading that, working along with that about with Senator Blessing on the transportation and the costs and the penalties basically that are assigned districts without any uh, due, due recourse or any um, way to protest or contest that. Right. Do you want to explain a little bit more about that? Uh, you. you know, at this point, uh, districts are being um, hit with a financial um, consequence uh, where it's been determined or it's been assumed that they are not transporting uh, non-district kids uh, for uh, private, parochial, et cetera. 
Uh, I know that our colleagues down the, down the, the, the road got hit with a big price tag, and so all the other districts are getting involved in it because transportation becomes a bigger issue. Uh, students can be off of the bus for several weeks. We don't know that they're not riding, and then it can come back that you're not pro providing transportation for this particular kid. Uh, I don't know how those petitions get written, but my main concern working with the committee, when you have a process or a policy or something in place, but you don't have a way to appeal it, then it's halfway done. It doesn't have a full circle of an opportunity for you to come back and say, this information that you provided is not, is not right. And it's a dollar figure that goes along with it. It's not just saying you're not providing transportation, you're getting penalized with, with a monetary hit. Thank you. That's my report. Thank you, Ms. Kuhn, Mr. Smith. Uh, next item is the Great Oaks Career Technical Center report, and that's me. Um, I sent out an email to all the board members with some documents from the meeting from uh, Mr. Snyder and some of his reports. Uh, the students on the spotlight report, we have a number of Winton Woods students who are recognized in here. Uh, Camille Johnson in Health Technologies, they headed a HOSA regional competition, um, and that is the Health Occupation Students of America uh, Society, basically, and uh, she came in first in a public service announcement. We had Shaylin Uribe Martinez, uh, same HOSA regional competition public service announcement uh, in surgical technologies, and he came in third place. Tavera Hill in health technologies, the public service announcement, and she, and she came in first place. And then we had Jaden Hogan, HOSA Regional Competition Public Service Announcement in Health Technologies, also on a team. Uh, I should point out these people were on a team. Came in first place. Uh, Gary Dorsey, who's in the dental program, um, same regional competition, competition health career display. Uh, his team came in third place. And Ariana Green in exercise science was in the sports medicine competition, and she came in second place. And one more, Jashana Derby was in the dental program and uh, the competition for competition for dental terminology uh, came in fourth place. And with that, I will end my Great Oaks report. Mr. Birdie, I have yes, a question. Sir. When these young people are being celebrated and honored and recognized, are there uh, opportunities where you can go to the event or is it just something that's done uh, right there on the class yeah, site? Yeah, those types of events are more of a regional offsite. They bring all the schools together at one location. Um, sometimes I do them in different cities, okay. not necessarily locally. So, uh, next item on the agenda is board recommendations and motions. Are there any recommendations or motions at this point? Seeing none, we will move forward with comments from the board member, superintendent, and treasurer, Mr. Seymour. I don't have any at this time. Let's just hope that uh, bond pricing goes well tomorrow. Yeah, all right, we will hope for that. <coughs> superintendent Smith. Yes, I mentioned at the last meeting, uh, I know the girls had not played their last game. Uh, unfortunately, we did not prevail. Uh, we didn't move forward, but uh, there is something even more exciting. The overall GPA of the girls team is a 3.8, and uh, there are at least six girls that have 4.0s. So letting you know that it's not just about the athletics, the academics as well. And I can tell you, based on their performance on the court and on the, in the classroom, those young ladies will get incredible offers. Um, Mrs. Um, the young lady um, Gray is playing in a, a championship game that I've never heard of before. Uh, the sponsored by Michael Jordan. Uh, she's also a McDonald's All-American. She has a 4.0. She is having a full ride to uh, Oregon, and her dad is her coach. And I think that makes it very, very uh, monumental. So I'm excited about her future, and hopefully some people will travel to uh, Chicago to see her play in the uh, McDonald's All-American game. That's fantastic. Board Member Smith. Um, just excited, once again, uh, all the work being done here. Uh, definitely excited to hear um, a lot of our athletes uh, doing well scholastically. That's exciting to hear uh, that we're not only excelling in athletics, but excelling in academics at the same time. Um, I was at the high school uh, working with the musical uh, Matilda, so I'm excited to see uh, how that will be uh, in our uh, first first musical in our auditorium. So that'll be exciting, um, and I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kuhn. 
Um, I wanted to thank the students and staff for the Night of Freedom, the two, two events. Uh, it was outstanding. I never <coughs> cease to be amazed by the caliber of our students, um, how hard they work, and our staff. So thank you for that. I know it's a lot of work, but it was uh, very appreciated. Um, I think there was it was very well attended here. It was like bumper to bumper at the South Campus. The North Campus was very well attended too. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for their hard work there. Uh, I do want to point out that um, uh, all of these programs that the district puts together works inside and outside the classroom and how these work together to create well-rounded students. And it doesn't come without a cost, time, energy, money. And our community can rest assured that their money is well spent on many programs from the academics to the uh, sports and the caliber of the level of uh, academics required for our students to participate and how they understand that they're a, um, what is it, the, the opposite of student, student athlete, they're an athletic student, but their <laughs> primary thing is to be student. Um, that gets them into higher levels of learning. It's great to be a great athlete, but you got to have the grades to go along with it. And I think having all these opportunities keeps our students engaged in participating in, in class and to succeed in life. And I want our community to know that it's really important for us to, to subsidize and to support our students that without music and the arts and the, um, uh, the sports and the other extracurriculars, life would be really boring. If we all just saw black and white without color, life would be really, really boring. So we're trying to enhance the, uh, the future of our students and we appreciate our community involvement. So thank you. To add to that, the 2.5 does help. GPA. Yeah. Bring that up again. Just Absolutely. say it one more time so in case people didn't hear it. Yeah. Minimum of 2.5 to participate at Wynwood City Schools for athletics. Yes. And that was a great decision. Yes. yes. I was not here when it was made, but I still believe it's a great decision. <laughs> great decision. <laughs> uh, Ms. Bryant. I wanted to echo, I was able to go to the North Campus um, Night of Freedom and I was just amazed at all the talent. I got to hear the jazz band and as a former clarinet player myself, I was in Banky. <laughs> I, I just, I'm like, oh my goodness, this, these are my people. Um, <laughs> phenomenal opportunity for students, parents, the community. I'm looking forward to more of those events and um, upcoming things that are coming from the district. I also wanted to say thank you to all those that were honored today, all of the teachers and the students for showing up and being a part of the community. And I'm just very thankful to be here and to serve. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson, are you gonna try something <laughs> I'm here? I'm gonna try. Okay. I don't have a lot of voice, guys. I'm really sorry. Don't scream. I won't. This is me screaming. Um, I would just want to, um, again, like everybody else, echo the comments of uh, sentiments of uh, thanking the people who came tonight to be honored, the recognitions, the gifts, and introductions. And uh, Mr. Lafayette uh, Mack was really impressed with the uh, person from Forest Park, how he commended him and what he's doing. Um, also, I mentioned this last month, but I want to mention it again about um, if you're a student, if your child is planning on going to college, you must fill out the FAFSA. That's the free application for federal student aid. And they need this information to s figure out any financial assistance, whether it's loans or whether it's grants or wh whatever, you, you need to fill that out. So just want to reiterate that. Um, there were a couple of events. Um, there's a couple of virtual credit checks that are gonna be going on in the month of April for the 11th grade and also for the uh, senior credit check and fee check. That's gonna be at the end of well, April the 19th, I think it is, was on the calendar. Um, let's see, oh, we've already mentioned the musical that's going to be going on. Um, of course, there's no school on Good Friday. Uh, so we want everybody to uh, know that and that the following Monday, there will be a professional development for the, um, for the staff and teachers and there's no school for students. Um, as always, we want to say thank you for, for to our Winwoods Teachers Association and the OPC employees. Uh, we appreciate what you do to the superintendent and to the treasurer. We also appreciate your teams for executing with excellence what they do. And um, it's it's hard to call out everybody, but we do appreciate everyone that um, does what they do for our students. 
um, I had an opportunity uh, with the student um, student achievement and the technology team. Um, Mrs. Rhonda Hobbs had us come in and do the little demonstration and I was so impressed by that. So if you don't understand what the loo is all about, you need to talk to Mrs. Hobbs. And we talked about another way to uh, demonstrate that learning platform so that parents and everyone else can know what our technology base is and what our schools, what our school district offers with regards to technology. And Mrs. Hobbs was really on board with, with doing that. Maybe we have to talk about in what way it will be done. But um, those of us, it, 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 it combined, the Lou combined uh, sports, fitness, physical activity, along with academics and knowledge. And, you know, people, you know, if you're competitive, you wanted to, you want to win, you want to get, you know, the math question right or the, the um, sorting of things right. So I just wanted to thank Mrs. Hobbs for setting that up with the student achievement. I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, so with that said, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, I think everybody said everything and I'm not sure what else I could add other than a big thank you to everybody involved in, uh, in helping do good things for the children of this community. Um, so we thank the teachers, staff, administrators, um, and any community members that are actively involved in, in what's going on as well as the parents. Um, Coach Mack, uh, you know, that's pretty incredible what he's doing for, for those children and his focus on the academics piece and making that a priority is, is fantastic as well. So with that, um, there is a need for an executive session, so we will need a motion to go into executive session. I would like to make a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of complaints against a public employee. I'll second. Ms. Bryant, second. No, Paula. Paula, sorry. Mm -hmm. It has been motioned and seconded. Mr. Seymour, will you call the vote? Mrs. Kuhn? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Birdie? Aye. Ms. Bryant? Aye. Dr. Johnson? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'd like to thank Waycross for your service. Uh, there will be no further action taken by this board following the executive session, so thank you everyone for attending.